Good morning, and welcome to the worship for the last Sunday after the Epiphany. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Our first reading of the day comes from 2 Kings and is beginning in the, in the second chapter. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know, keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, yes, I know, be silent. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they were standing both by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I'm taken from you. Elisha said, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, you have asked for a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. 
Our psalm today is Psalm 50. The Lord, the God of hosts, has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God reveals himself in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame, and round about him a raging storm. He calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of his people. Gather before me, my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare the rightness of the cause, for God himself is judge. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians, beginning in the fourth chapter. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen, until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. So, our readings today are the readings that we have in this year of the lectionary for the very last Sunday after the Epiphany. Now, it's less important that it's the last Sunday after the Epiphany and more important that it is the, it is the Sunday before Lent. And Lent begins, as many of you know, with Ash Wednesday. Um, and there will be a worship video on Ash Wednesday. You will not be given ashes by me on Ash Wednesday, but, you know, we can pray about it. Um, and there will be a sermon. But it's important that it's the Sunday before Lent, because Lent is the season that runs up to the death and subsequent resurrection of Jesus. And so in the readings, we hear the stories that are running up to the death and subsequent resurrection of Jesus. And in this one, it's, it's from the Gospel of Mark, which, again, you probably heard me say this before, but I like to repeat things, that the Gospel of Mark is the shortest of our four canonical Gospels. The Gospel of Thomas is not a canonical Gospel, though it's got a lot of good stuff in there. Um, but Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels. It's the one with the fewest amount of detail, uh, the least amount of detail, and it's the one where everything happens immediately. And it's the one where we don't get to see Jesus pray a whole lot, as we discussed in the sermon last week. And, and yet, 
we have this story that does appear in other Gospels as well. Slightly altered, but same story. And the story, you know, has been named by Christians and thoughtful people after the fact. It has been named the Transfiguration because a few select, a small group of Jesus' students got to see Jesus in a whole new light, literally. He was transfigured. And a kind of theological way to think about this is that, and you could think of it also as a, a spiritual way to think about this, is that what they saw in Jesus in that, that beautiful moment, it was also a terrifying moment, was who he really was. The closest that human eyes can behold in this realm of crazy brokenness in these bodies that don't always cooperate. Oh, wait, they rarely cooperate. They saw the holiness and the purity and the godliness of Jesus. And in their minds, that involved a lot of light. Everything was bright and shiny. It makes me think of Christmas cards and glitter. But anyway, it involved a lot of light. And in fact, especially in the Gospel of John, different Gospel from this one, but you know, it's still Gospel. There's lots and lots of images of light in darkness. And that ends up playing out through all the Christian faith. Images of light, light in the darkness. But that's not the only thing that was going on at the top of them, that particular mountain. And by mountain, you, you, you can't think Everest. You got to think like, you can't even think the Rockies or, or the Appalachians. You got to think really big hill, barren, desert-like, but not what we might think of as a mountain. It's not the Himalayas, friends. Um, but it's a, you know, it's better to think of mountaintop experiences than hilltop experiences. So <clears throat> on the top of this mountain, um, other things are also happening. And Peter, John, and James see two figures with Jesus, and they know, so the story goes, exactly who they are. And they are ancient biblical figures. And they're figures that would have held great meaning for Peter, James, and John. Elijah and Moses. Moses and Elijah. And what those two figures meant to those Jewish men was the very high point of two historical figures who were close to God. Two historical figures who had seen God. Moses had seen God face to face. Moses knew the mind of God, knew what God wanted us to do. Moses took down the Ten Commandments. Moses gave us the law. It, whose law? God's law. And Elijah was the foremost prophet. What's a prophet? A prophet is the mouthpiece of God. And so you've got the mind of God and the voice of God standing there with Jesus. And what Jesus has revealed to us through his ministry and through his work in the world and through the teachings that we have been left, is that he knows the heart of God. And so up there standing on the mountain is someone who knows the mind of God, someone who knows the voice of God, and someone who knows the heart of God. And before Jesus, there was no one who knew the heart of God. 
There was just the mind of God. There was just the voice of God. And now we know the heart of God. And humorously, because if you read between the lines, there's great humor in this story. You can read it in a stuffy way, and perhaps I did, but you can also read between the lines and see the hilarious bit when Peter has his terrified reaction. So Peter, and James and John, but Peter is the one who speaks and puts his foot in his mouth, sees this amazing thing. I mean, they're following Jesus. They know he's their teacher. He's said some strange things, and he's said some understandable things, and he's said some really difficult things. And it's easy to discount the strange things, and it's easy to remember the, the difficult things, and it's easy to reinterpret many things. But he probably didn't realize who he really was, or he would not have been so astounded when a piece of that was revealed to him. But as the story goes, Peter, James, and John knew instantly that it was Moses standing there with Jesus, that it was Elijah standing there with Jesus. And their response was, essentially, teacher, it's good you brought some strong backs with you because we'll build an altar to this moment. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he was terrified, and he didn't really know what to say. And in that moment, the most he could imagine of himself was that he could be a hired laborer. He could be a friend with a strong back. He didn't realize the gift that was being given wasn't so that he could just remain a strong back. It was so that he could know what was in store for him, eventually. And the point of the exercise wasn't so that you could take a photograph of it or take a video and let it go viral or build little shrines on the mountainside to a beautiful moment that happened once long ago. The moment, the point of the moment so that you can fully experience it and then take it home with you. Not the memory of it, but to let yourself be changed by the moment and to take the change home with you. It's like, it's like when you go on vacation. Well, when we used to go on vacations, you know, back then before the pandemic, and there's a beauty in keeping a journal or taking some pictures so that you can have something to remind you of those beautiful moments. But there is an extreme state of that. And I've seen it with people, and I have experienced it myself and realized the error of my ways, when you never come out from behind the camera, when you never come out from behind, well, in the old days, the video recorder, the camcorder, or these days, when you don't get the whole experience, you just see it within the frame of your camera, within the frame of your phone. When that narrow piece that never quite captures the fullness and the majesty and the glory and the amazingness of the moment, when that's the only thing you experience to begin with. And you know, I look at my photos from old vacations, back when we could vacation places, and it does spark the memory of that moment, of that hike, of that dinner, of that time on the beach. 
but the pictures don't do nearly as much for other people as they do for me because the pictures don't convey the whole of the experience. And what the pictures do for me is remind me of the experience that I had, which was always far more than the small pictures or even the bits of video. The whole experience, you know, the whole experience of bungee jumping is complete and vast and molecular. And the video of watching someone bungee jump, it lacks something. The person is very tiny. The cord is very long. The ravine doesn't seem that impressive. As if it might, if you were standing on a plank looking down into it, with a cord wrapped around your legs. The point isn't the picture or the video. The point is to remember what happened and how we were changed by it. And so we have this story of the transfiguration of something that happened. And you know, I don't think it happened for Jesus' benefit. Eh, maybe it did. Maybe he needed to have a conversation with Moses and Elijah before he died and was risen. But it's possible that he did it for Peter, James, and John to teach them that death was not the end. to teach them that these bodies are not who we really are, to teach them that they are more than they think they are. Did they understand right away? Clearly no, no, not if that was the point of the teaching. Did they get it eventually? Maybe. Maybe. Amen. Our service continues with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made. Of one being with the Father, <clears throat> through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Almighty God, during this time of social distancing and self-quarantine, we ask that you remind us of our deep connection with one another. Help us to reach out in love and safe ways to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. Fill our hearts with compassion for those who must work with others and risk exposure, for those who need to work but cannot, for those juggling childcare and working from home, for those who have been infected by coronavirus, for all those who are suffering and in pain from other illnesses, we pray that they may be made well and whole once more. For all those who have died, 
for those filled with hope and those filled with despair, for those whose faith was clear, and for those whose faith is known to you alone, we pray that they may rest in peace. We pray for our nation and for all those in authority, the president, the governor, our county executives, our local leaders, and the CDC, that they may make wise decisions and have right actions for the welfare and benefit of us all. We pray for Trinity Church, for Sarah, Michael, and Rose, for Andy, Joanne, and Bruce, for Linda and Ernie, for Joan, Matthew, and Lynn, for Michelle, JJ, Alana, and Mariah, for Bob, Bonnie, Ted, and Reggie, for Lorraine, Deb, Rich, Linda, Lena, Freya, Parker, Jackson, Jocelyn, Jordan, Chris, Colin, and Kelly, for Kathy and Joanne, for Walter and Jane, for Chris and Judy, and for Louise. We pray for our families, friends, and neighbors, especially Holy Apostles Perry and St. Luke's Attica, for our local churches here in Warsaw, and for Jamie, Pam, David, James and Barb D, Anne, George, Phil, Steve W, Bob M, and those others that you may name now. We pray for all those in the military and for those in the National Guard who have been mobilized for the safety and welfare of our nation. And especially we pray for Robert. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Hallelujah.